Welcome to Dementia Resilience with Jill Lorenz, a candid conversation as we learn about types of dementias, such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, frontal temporal, and Lewy body, and the effects on the people we love. Jill's years of dedication and experience help you adapt, overcome obstacles, and find positive outcomes. It's time for Dementia Resilience with Jill Lorenz. Hi, friends and everyone in Caregiver Nation. I have to tell you, I'm pretty thrilled today because last year I was at a conference for frontal temporal dementia. It's actually frontal temporal degeneration. And uh, I was listening to some dynamic speakers. And I mentioned as I talked about that conference that there was one in particular that really stood out to me. And I am so happy she agreed to be on the show today. And her name is Mary O'Hara. And Mary is a licensed clinical social worker with the Rocky Mountain Neurobehavioral Associates. And Mary just her talk was so dynamic and so on point for people working li- working and living with FTD and other types of dementia that I begged her to be on the show and she's in the studio with me today. Hi Mary. Hi. I'm so glad to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really honored to be here. Well, it's funny because you said when we came in that you're used to listening to people. Right? I'm more of a listener, yeah. You're I more of a that. listener. <laughs> And I'm much more of a talker, so we're going to make this work yes. really well today. But we have listeners uh, for the show all over the world. And um, these diseases don't stop at any borders. They don't stop at Colorado. They don't stop at the United States. And they don't stop in other countries. So universally, we see the same symptoms generally uh, with folks. And my listeners telling me that... that um, you know, where they live, it happens too, right? So let's start with, tell me about the work that you do. So as you as you mentioned, I'm a social worker, and I am part of a small private practice here in in Englewood, right, right outside of Denver. Um, we focus our work on supporting individuals and families living with different neurological conditions. So that could be Alzheimer's disease, Um, frontal temporal degeneration, primary progressive aphasia, Lewy body disease, or even um, Parkinson's disease or the effects of stroke or concussion or brain injury. So we really, again, focus on supporting people with neurological disorders. Okay. So I have a question for you right off the top. I always thought primary progressive aphasia was part of FTD. Am I wrong about that? It's It's a language variant of FTD. Okay. Yeah. All right. So with frontal temporal, which we uh, use the acronym FTD, there is the behavioral variant. Mm -hmm. There's the primary progressive aphasia variant. Mm -hmm. And then there's also one that really affects your motor skills. Yeah. There's CBD and PSP, which are also forms of the FTLD family. Okay. And they present with with, um, more motor symptoms. So they are a little bit different. But I I really do think it is important to um, name these other other forms of FTD because they're so different than the behavioral changes that that, that are so common with FTD. Right. Um, In our support group, I would say we probably have um, as many people caring for someone with PPA as we do caring for someone with FTD. So um, I do think it is to name important to name them separately because they are they are so different. Right. Um, and and the experience per person is very different. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know, you can yeah. have some people that that uh, maybe have some serious issues but then overall take it pretty well like my brother. He's been mm-hmm. on the show twice. I have a brother with frontal temporal and he has both PPA mm-hmm. and BV. Yeah. And these are very, very different. And so as I was talking to you, you were talking about the different range of emotions that people experience when they have this diagnosis Mm -hmm. or even in their presentation. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that just a little bit? Well, first, as you said, everyone experiences this differently. And the news of a new diagnosis, it can be such 
a life-changing event for a person who has insight into what's happening, who's aware of what's happening. But there, this disease can also, or these diseases can also present in a way where the person truly doesn't know what's happening to them. They really don't have insight. The part of their brain that regulates insight, that awareness of what's happening to ourselves, is is disrupted by the disease process. So I think families sometimes um, misunderstand that as the person being in denial Mm -hmm. um, when, in fact, the person really doesn't think there's anything wrong. In fact, it's it's you who has the problem. It's you. Why are you taking them? Why are you taking me to the doctor? Why are you taking away my driver's license? There's nothing wrong with me. So there is that. I think there's that big difference in receiving a diagnosis for people who have an awareness of what's happening and then there are people who don't. Um, And I think the course is probably quite different in terms of how we are um, ensuring those people receive the best care and the best um, support because someone who's aware is is more likely to experience those feelings of grief and loss and depression and anger Um, and And are able to, they're more likely to work towards a place of acceptance, whereas someone who's not aware wouldn't be able to, um, they don't think there's anything wrong. So they they wouldn't need that type of emotional support. Mm -hmm. Um, Right. Yeah. So if if we can, I just don't want to assume that listeners know what these different diseases are. So Mm -hmm. let's just break them down just a little bit. So the behavioral variant. Typically, as I have seen it uh, with with folks I work with and even with my brother, has been um, spending money uh, rapidly or for extravagant purchases that maybe aren't needed, mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, difficulty with judgment and reasoning. I shouldn't drive a car. It's it, because I'm not being careful and not really looking at it as a privilege you know, mm-hmm. rather than a right. Um, you know, issues like that. We've seen things like that. Oftentimes, families will say to me, that person just doesn't seem like the same person I've known yeah. for all these years. What's your take on it? Um, yeah, the BB the, piece. The, the behavioral variant can have um, a number of, of different presentations. Um, not everyone experiences all the different behaviors. Um there, I think even within BVFTD, there's a a type that results in a person being more apathetic, and then a type that results in uh, more extravagant, more excessive behaviors that are really difficult to to manage and and for the families to cope with and and control. Right, and we'll get into apathy yeah. uh, really more specifically, mm-hmm. but also they can kind of have a heightened sexual drive sometimes. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they don't. Yeah. Yeah, issues like that. But the thing is that there really isn't uh, any memory loss in the onset or through the course of the disease generally. So people miss it and they just think the person's just behaving badly. Yeah. Right? It's so often misdiagnosed as mental illness or marital problems um, or really significant depression. So it can take many years for a person to get an accurate diagnosis because they had been in, they hadn't been to a neurologist. That wasn't, that wasn't the course that families were guided down because of the presentation. So it, it can be many years before a person gets the right the right diagnosis and the right care. Right. So then primary progressive aphasia. I uh, had a client once that just spoke the same words over and Mm -hmm. over again or repeated what you said, echophasia. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just something that was uh, pertinent to her life, like, God bless you, I love you, God bless you, I love you, you know. I had another client that just repeated um, numbers and and said a various word like boom <laughs> in the middle of it. Explain primary progressive aphasia. Um, so again, it's a it's a language it's a language variant, and um, it begins in the temporal lobe, where um, language and communication um, numbers are also regulated. So those are some of the first symptoms that we see. Maybe it's word finding um, or 
a loss of a meaning of words. So they might be pointing to a pen and not know what the pen is called anymore. So they lose the meaning of words. Okay. Um, they're um, often people with PPA do have insight into the changes, and so they um, may be at a higher risk for experiencing depression because they're aware of what's happening. Mm-hmm. Um, speech and language therapy can be really supportive to people with PPA. I didn't know that. So we actually in our in our clinic have um, a speech and language pathologist who works with people with primary progressive aphasia to really help not only compensate for the language loss and learn new tools of working around the language loss, whether that's through um, keep making a a very individualized notebook with things that they commonly say, helping them write scripts if they do plan to give a speech at a wedding or need to make certain phone calls. Using learning to use their if they use a smartphone, you're learning to use that in a way to help with communication. Okay. And oftentimes our speech therapist and I know speech therapists in other locations as well will work with family members also um, at the same time. So the family members can also carry um, carry the work on after the session is over. I think that's brilliant. Yeah. I've never heard of that. So I think I think that's really terrific because. It's nice to know that even though we don't have a cure for these mm-hmm. diseases, uh, we certainly have ways that we can utilize therapies to be yeah. more effective with with these folks to give them some hope that, yeah. you know, all is not lost. And yeah. We can still work with you in various ways to make your life um, more enjoyable yeah. and, and keep the quality of life yeah. and your dignity intact. It really is about right? that, about quality of life. Um, I think... It's the expectation, especially with speech therapy, is not to stop the progression of the disease. It's to learn tools of compensating and living your best with it. Well said. Yeah. Well said. Now, you don't just work with uh, FTD, so I don't want to to have this whole conversation about that. But um, I did want to kind of move to um, behavior symptoms that people can look for uh, not being... Uh, too overly critical. That's not what we're looking for, but changes in patterns. Um, uh, and I think one of the things that I think about often is, so maybe that person had a quirky personality in the past, mm-hmm. but is it different now? Yeah. Is it more exaggerated now? Those symptoms more exaggerated now? Is that kind of what you're looking at too? Like they may have already been present, but has it changed in some way? Yeah. Is it better or worse than it was in years past or is it more exaggerated? You know, some I've heard a lot of families describe that, but that maybe they were always really friendly, um, but now they're rolling down the window at every stop sign and trying to have conversations with people. Or maybe they're going up to children or other strangers that feels more inappropriate. So sometimes there is this exaggeration of the way that a person always was because with FTD especially and with Alzheimer's disease eventually and some of the other forms of dementia, we lose that social filter that stops us from doing something that you and I might know, oh, that's not really appropriate to do. They right. lose that that ability to gauge whether something's appropriate anymore. So sometimes we do see that um, extravagance of a person was very um, boisterous and outgoing that we see that um, continued. Um, and what about maybe compulsive behaviors, mm-hmm. something that they do almost in a ritualistic way? Yeah. Um, that is also... Um, very common with with FTD and some of the other dementias as well. We can see that. Um, Sometimes it's a form of comfort to them to be doing something over and over. Um, It's a repetition. Really? It can um, sometimes help them calm themselves to be do it, to be able to do those things over and over and we and we often say that if it's not harming anyone and it's not costing any money is it okay for it to continue you know i um, love that you said that because 
I don't think anybody in the past few years on this show has ever said that. So if somebody is pacing back and forth, it might be driving you crazy, Mm -hmm. uh, but it might be comforting to them. If they're getting up and down out of a chair or they're tapping on a table or they're wringing their hands or something, that may not be a problem. Is that what I heard you say? And Well, in some cases, it's not. I think in other cases, it might be a sign that this person is in some kind of distress. They're not comfortable. And so how can we be uh, modifying the environment or modifying our communication with them to help them feel more comfortable? But but sometimes do that repetitive behavior is it's an activity for a person. It's um, again, if it's not it, if they don't seem to be in distress because of it, then is it okay for it to continue? Like you said, it might be really bothersome and um, frustrating for family members to see and upsetting for them to see that maybe this person who, you know, was a very accomplished teacher or some or in, in just accomplished in another setting is now um, doing something that you never really imagined they would be right. doing. Right. And, you know, some of the biggest questions I get are about aggression Mm -hmm. and how do you handle aggression? I'm just going to give you some examples. You know, it doesn't mean the person is um, throwing items at you or something like that. But I think especially uh, with Lewy body and sometimes Alzheimer's when um, a person feels misunderstood, most likely, or there's an unmet need that isn't being addressed. Uh, they may uh, get a little bit sharp in their tone, mm-hmm. um, yell at someone, say something to someone that is unkind, yeah. uh, accuse them of stealing delusions. You know, uh, our Parkinson's friends have um, uh, oftentimes have hallucinations and different psychosis of that nature. So when people come in and are asking you to help them with something that has to do with aggression, where do you begin to drill down to look at how do I even start to to uncover what's causing this? Yeah. Is that a fair question? Yeah. Um, so, again, with someone with a disease where they are not able to control themselves in the way that they used to be able to, we can't expect them to be able to control their aggressive behavior either. So it really falls on the family and friends to um, learn new ways of helping the person calm down or learning new ways of helping themselves cope with um, the aggression. Do you think we miss, do you think we miss that piece? I mean, you've Mm -hmm. said it twice, and for some reason it was surprising to me, that we have to really think about how that person feels about this new diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And it, that that reaction could be prolonged over yeah. weeks or months, and we're just looking at the moment-to-moment yeah. scenarios, not what's yeah. deep in our heart and soul. Yeah. Are we missing that emotional piece? Well, I think it's a I, – I, I agree. It should not be overlooked. I think it's such an important part of this whole experience for everyone. I mean, with, with these losses – um, whether a person is aware of them or not, they can they can be really frustrating, and they can cause anger and frustration and um, sadness, and um, that can build up in us. And to feel like you are losing control, to feel like you are losing your independence, to be irritated that you can't be doing something you know you used to be able to do. Yeah, you might snap sometimes if that if there's nowhere else for that to go. Right. Um, Do you does your office provide counseling and and such for people mm-hmm. like that? Because I don't know that we suggest that often yeah. enough. Um, we'll send family members to support groups. Yeah. We'll send people with diagnosis to support groups. But in all fairness, I think sometimes they just become. Uh, sessions for people to unload what's on their mind, not mm-hmm. necessarily therapeutic. And I don't know that so often we ever say, maybe it'd be a good idea to get into some counseling yeah. or something. Let's let's work through these. Do you think that there's a possibility we could make that person's journey easier if we included them in some counseling at yeah. some point? I, I truly believe that. And that's what really 
has drawn me to this work that I do now is for so many years in, in a number of different settings, whether it was um, working at the Alzheimer's Association on their helpline or working in long-term care, or I, I also worked at a, um, a clinic and a research center. And I so often saw people with a diagnosis really struggling, and there wasn't there, – there were programs – um, that were social and engaging, and there were support groups, but there wasn't really a um, a very established practice for people to see someone individually. And so that's that really um, has has designed the work that I do now and that I focus my practice on is seeing people in the early stages. Um, it is it is different than other types of therapy because it's short term. We know that over time, a person wouldn't be able to meaningfully participate in mm-hmm. in in the therapy in that way. Right. But I, th- but that is, I think that's understood up front. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the model that I have used is based on um, a social worker named Robin Yale. Um, she she wrote a book on counseling people with Alzheimer's disease, and so that's really the work that I've been doing. I, I model off of um, of her book that she she created this program with the Alzheimer's Association and it did evaluations of it. Um, and the you know the the focus is really focusing on the capacity for resilience in the face of hardship. So it is processing those difficult emotions, but also talking about really practical lifestyle changes. And what are you going to do when you when you are no longer able to drive right. and working towards a place of acceptance? So I want to tell you, um, we're going to take a break in about f- uh, four minutes, not right now. But I want to tell you uh, that we, <clears throat> I I see extreme value in sharing with somebody in the gentlest way when you see them struggling. So it's not, oh, look, uh, you're repeating yourself three, four times. You know, in Alzheimer's, it doesn't always show itself that way. Mm -hmm. We very, very rarely get a chance to see inside someone in the earliest stages. And I think that there's some real value into laying a path for the journey you're going to be on of honesty and openness. And if you are afraid, come and talk to me. Mm-hmm. Pinky swear with somebody that, that you know, if you're having problems, you yeah. can you have a safe place to go and they won't share it with everybody yeah. in the world and, you know, stuff like that. And I think that when you see somebody that is struggling with not being able to learn new information, uh, when you see somebody losing items over and over, um, not being able to recall a memory, not once or twice, or walking into a room where you can't remember why you were there, but, you know, multiple times a day, Um, just things like that. And if there's clear signs, and especially if there's a family history, there's some serious value to laying that path and trying to make it easier for someone we don't do that enough. Mm-hmm. We don't. We don't even tell people that that's a, a, a communication that they could yeah. use, a communication technique they yeah. could use. There's so much stigma with this disease, <sighs> and so much embarrassment, and not wanting anyone to know, and not wanting to, not wanting even people who do know to know what else is going on, what else right. you might be struggling with. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm telling you, I think there is a just an enormous amount of good work we could do for people and with people if we just showed some compassion Mm -hmm. and really instead of being accusing and and judging them, really talk with them about uh, what we're seeing and include them in the conversation. So uh, we're going to continue this conversation, but when we come back, these are the things I want to touch on, Mary. I want to talk about the family aspect Mm-hmm. And let's uh, we've been talking right now about the person that has a diagnosis, but let's talk about how the family deals yeah. with it. And then I heard you talk about five ideas you had. Um, I really thought your your speech was amazing. I also liked Hal Wurzel. I talked to him. But you know why I thought it was good? Do you want to know why I thought right. it was good? Because you spoke in a language that people in the room could understand. Clinicians don't mean to, but oftentimes they come at it from a scientific Mm -hmm. uh, portion. They're just looking at um, 
you know, what symptoms are you seeing? And we're going through this, 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 and this. And I thought you really broke down the compassion of the diseases. Mm -hmm. And that's why I wanted you on the show today. So um, when we come back from our break, we're going to dive into how do you help families um, take these difficult dynamics and change it into something that can make sense for everybody in the room to communicate. Can we do that? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, we'll take a break and listen to a word from our sponsor, and we'll be right back. Hey, friends. I'm excited to tell you about Pine Grove Crossing Assisted Living and Memory Care in Parker, Colorado. They set the bar high for person-centered care. They're locally owned, and they focus on exceeding their residents' expectations while providing excellent dining, housekeeping, and transportation services. Their care team with licensed nurses are available 16 hours per day, seven days a week, to ensure clinical needs are addressed as soon as possible. Check them out at pinegrovecrossing.com or 303-996-8000 and see how care goes into everything they do. Welcome back to Dementia Resilience with Jill Lorenz, a candid conversation as we learn about types of dementias, such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, frontal temporal, and Lewy body, and their effects on the people we love. Okay, we're back, and I am so blessed to have Mary O'Hara in the studio with me today because, um, as I've mentioned before, I listened to Mary at a conference I was at last year and just thought that she had a very interesting and unique approach to the way she described her work with people with frontal temporal, and later I learned why. It's because you are part of a support group. So you're really, you're not just a, a clinician or a social worker that sits in the office and people come in and so you're reacting to their action or you're trying to solve a behavior. You actually sit in support group with these folks and hear what's going on in their lives. That gives you a unique perspective, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, before we get on to the families and, and their position and their new changing, ever-changing roles, was there anything that we didn't uh, talk deeply enough or something you wanted to go back and maybe address you before know, we move on? You know, when we were talking about compulsive or these very ritualistic behaviors before, I just wanted to share some ideas with listeners about other things that they might try. Great. Um, so like I said, if, if it's safe and it's not costing money and it's okay for it to continue, that's one an option, but um, maybe encouraging another different safe repetitive activity instead. Um, so you could help a person, you know, start raking the lawn or sweeping or folding or doing puzzles or any kind of supervised walking. Great. Um, another another idea that I know occupational therapists use a lot is giving them a tactile object to squeeze. So maybe that's a squeeze ball or something that they can physically do with their hands, a Rubik's cube or something just to occupy them and it's okay. and it's tactile. Perfect. Um, and then if you if if there are rooms a, a person shouldn't go in or places that you you want to keep them out of, putting a sign up that just says stop or turn around. Um, so that they're going to see that, and it's um, it's kind of an automatic response that we all have when we see a stop sign. Mm -hmm. um, so if if there's rooms around the house that you might need to put those kind of signs on the doors, and then of course for families, um, because these behaviors can be challenging, um, making sure that they find respite away from the behavior and they're taking care of themselves in that way too. That's huge, because so often we see the person that is caring for the one with the diagnosis get sick or become impaired in some way, uh, physically, emotionally, socially, whatever, yeah. and see repercussions from that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the same, in the same breath before we move on, um, I think one of the things that you had said was don't always assume that it's the disease, mm -hmm. right? The person could be in pain. Mm -hmm. They could be taking new medications, Um too much change in their routine, right? Yeah. Other yeah. things like that. What yeah. else? Um, sometimes a really o overstimulating room um, can can cause someone to react really differently or become really agitated or irritated. Um, and something that you and I might might 
just interpret as, oh, it's not that loud, a, a restaurant, it's, you know, it's dinner hour, it's not that bad, might be really overwhelming for someone with right. cognitive impairment. Um, also things like lack of sleep or maybe um, they haven't had, you know, adequate nutrition, these kinds of things also might. It makes a difference, yeah. right? And just what you were saying about the restaurants, I always tell the families that I work with, don't set your loved one in the middle of the room. Mm-hmm. They yeah. literally can hear everything going yeah. on. You know, sit in a booth, sit on the perimeter so it's not so distracting. Or go mm-hmm. at 5 o'clock when, right. when the restaurant is likely to be empty. <laughs> right, yeah. right. But I think that's an important point to remember is that a person's behavior is communicating something to us, and we have to figure out what that is. Well, that's exactly right. So what are they trying to communicate to us by continuously standing up or saying, we need to go, we need to go, we need to go? What are they telling us? What is behind that behavior? Right. It's too loud in here. My body aches. I'm tired. I'm not hungry. I can't read the menu. Yeah. All kinds of things. So our job is to seek to understand. Yeah. Uh, And And sometimes... Um, just words words become more difficult and it can be more difficult to articulate exactly what a person is feeling with these conditions. Mm-hmm. So um, recognizing that they might not be able to tell you, um, but that doesn't mean there's not something there. And right. And we have to figure out what that is. Right. What's the DICE approach? Um, the DICE approach is a way to understand and come up with different interventions for behaviors. Oh, I like it. Um, it, it, the D stands for um, describe the behavior. So what is happening? Who is who is there when it happens? Um, what what seems to be triggering it? Okay. Um, investigate the causes. So why is this happening? Does it only happen when when his sister is here? Does it only happen when it's early in the morning or late at night? Um, C stands for create a plan. So. Create a plan can be a a list of a lot of different things you can try. Um, And I I encourage people to try things that they they might (laughs) that might seem out of the ordinary um, because this disease makes things out of the ordinary. So we really have to try a lot of different approaches. Um, So I encourage people to try different different interventions, even if they question if it's actually going to work. Um, well, you know, I think if we use that person's history, that create a plan will mm-hmm. make a difference. Because if you can find a meaningful activity for them to engage in, yeah. something that's meaningful for them. Yeah. Is it listening to music? Is it playing cards? Is it yeah. going for a walk? Is it just having a conversation? Yeah. Is it going in the kitchen and cooking or whatever it is? Um, just looking through picture books. Is that kind yeah. of what you mean? Yeah. Okay. And um, what's the E? And then E stands for evaluate. Did it work? Did it not work? If it didn't work, why not? We have to go back then to C and look at some of our other options of create a plan. Um, just an example that comes to mind, I was working, I think I shared this at the conference, I was working with someone who um, was caring for someone with very impulsive behaviors. And so anywhere they were, they were flipping on lights and um, pushing elevator buttons and just very this this need to to touch and utilize what was in front of them. Um, and so the, the wife had to use the bathroom. They were leaving an appointment and she has, had to use the bathroom and she said, please wait here. Um, and the gentleman who had FTD saw a fire alarm um, oh, no. and, pulled, and pulled the fire alarm because it was there and it said pull. And that's, right. <laughs> that's part of the disease. It told him to do it, yeah. right? That actually makes sense. So if you look um, at through the lens of their eyes, yeah, yeah, yeah. their brain, right? Um, yeah. And so, you know, the fire department came, and um, and she, the the wife was so distraught, thinking, well, how, "What am I going to do? I can't even go to the bathroom anymore." So we we used this dice approach to come up with some different ideas. So um, the you know describe the behavior was he's just impulsive and disinhibited and. Um, you, and has that utilization behavior where he touches anything that's in front of him. Right. Um, investigate the cause. Why did this happen? Well, it's part of the disease that he does this. And um, he was left alone. And he was alone. Mm-hmm. So, Neuroscience yeah. said pull. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so create a plan. We, we actually use that example I, I shared before, um, some kind of ball to squeeze or something he can be doing to distract him um, with his hands and also with his mind. So whether it's a Rubik's Cube or something that he can use or even a phone to look at pictures or sh- a video she can right, show him. Right. Um, okay. So it's, it's, it's easy to remember and um, – it, I think it also allows you to return to the list of create a plan ideas um, to see what else might work. I love that. Now, uh, kind of segueing, on your aggressive behavior, this is an example of how you, I thought you brought something else out to uh, families that they could utilize that maybe they nobody tells them sometimes. You know, uh, so like you said, uh, you gave examples of shouting, name calling, lewd comments, hitting people. And um, I, I like the idea of handing out cards. This person has, you know, memory loss or this person has uh, frontal temporal disease and may not make good judgments or, or say things that um, seem like they don't have a filter. Please be kind mm-hmm. or what, whatever you have. But the big keys were avoid confrontation, be calm. Validate their feelings. Mm-hmm. You seem like, really angry right now. You seem really upset. Yeah. And that must be difficult. Yeah. Saying, why are you so angry? That's not showing them that you understand, yeah. you know, or stop yelling at me. This isn't, if we, I can't communicate with you. If you just said, yeah. you seem really angry right now, that must be difficult. They might just feel or hear that and be able to calm themselves. And that's your goal, right? You're trying to eliminate. The confrontation, give them some space, yeah, validate really minimize the impact of minimize the, the impact. Yeah. There you go. So, how about the families? Boy, in your support groups, you have the families sitting mm-hmm. there, right? It's um, it's such a different. It can be such an, a different experience for the families. They mm-hmm. they're not the ones diagnosed with the disease, but they live this disease, and, and they live it in such a different way. Um, there is there is grief around this, and I feel like it's really unrecognized grief that they're experiencing. And then this um, anticipatory loss. They know that this, if they have a good understanding of the disease, they know this will get worse, and they know things might get harder. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they carry that with them right. every day. Um, and that's no matter what disease it is, if it's Parkinson's, if it's Lewy body, if it's you know, frontal temporal, if it's Alzheimer's, they all have that anticipatory yeah. loss and that sense of they're going to lose that person, uh, that person's soul, that person's mm-hmm. being, right? And the, I think it's also confusing as Pauline Boss described this term of ambiguous loss where the person, the person's still here, but they're not here. They're different. Right. Um, right. I worked with a family member who used to say, you know, he's John, not John, still John. He's right. all of those things. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was a way of her reconciling that he's here and not here at the same time. I'll tell you a two-sided sword I see is the apathy issue. Mm-hmm. Okay, lack of empathy, um, apathy being uh, maybe that person is very self-centered in their thoughts. They're not caring about other people's emotions. That's a two-way street. Yeah. Oftentimes we blame it on the disease. But I like to get real with my listeners. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's a two-way street. You know, us not understanding, like we talked about in Mm -hmm. the first part of this show, and understanding the emotional impact on the person with the diagnosis. Yeah. We just think they're supposed to kind of get the diagnosis, and then we're just going to start seeing the stages and the symptoms and the presentation, and it is what it is, and everything's blamed on that, where we don't dig deep Mm -hmm. to the emotional piece. And that's where I think interventions like art therapy can be so powerful Mm, because it gives the person who may not even have insight into what they're experiencing um, a place to express what's happening. They are, they may not think they have FTD, but they know they're losing control and they know that things are different um, and they know that something's happening. And, and so to have a, a way to express that, not using words, because we know language is affected with these diseases. So right. to have a way of expressing that through art, I think, is also really powerful. I agree. Yeah. So what else about the families? What's what's the changing dynamic? I mean, I, I've seen it in my own family, the, the different roles of <clears throat> maybe your 
a child of a person that has the disease, and now all of a sudden you seem like you're more in a mothering role or, you know, mm -hmm. youngest in the family, and now it feels like you have to be the oldest because you're taking care of things or... Wife and husband have a changing role of they were partners, and now this has become a caregiver role. Yeah. How do you help families with that? Again, it's it's so different for every family, and it's it's not just one of those things. It's all of those things at the That's same right. time. So not only is the relationship changed, um, but the the well family member who who doesn't have the disease doesn't always feel like they can express how they feel to the person. Um, so they're keeping that to themselves. And maybe I've heard so many adult children say, and my mom was the one I always went to to talk about hard things. And now right. I can't talk. I can't talk about that with her. So it's like there's the primary loss of the disease. And then there are the, all these secondary losses that include changes in relationships. Um, and then not to mention all the, all the, um, kind of very practical things that need to be discussed and changed. And sometimes a, a person with the disease is on board with those changes, and sometimes they're not. So families are put in such a difficult position, right. especially when the person doesn't feel they need a change to happen, whether it's with the car or banking, that they are put in this position of being the bad guy to to make those changes. And it it's always in the interest of the person's health and safety, but it, it doesn't always feel like that way for the person. So I think the the families are juggling all of that at the same time. They're grieving. They're anticipating things are going to get worse. And then maybe they're dealing with a crisis in the moment because they – they are worried about the car um, being being driven, or insurance you know, there's going concerns. Up. Yeah, or there's Losing concerns it. about um, financial scams. People with are so vulnerable with this disease that yeah. Um, so I feel like there's such there's there's this chronic state of anxiety and stress that the family members feel mm -hmm. um, because they're always having to stay you know five steps ahead and think about is this going to how is how might the person react to this or how am I going to talk about this to them? And how can I keep things as normal as possible? How do I keep them right. engaged in the things they love even though a lot has changed? So, And even the things they love could have changed. And how about acknowledging what we can't see? Yeah. I mean, that's huge. That was one of the things that you spoke about in your in your piece at the conference that I thought was pretty brilliant. Can we talk about that for a minute? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when someone ha – I've used this analogy before with families, but when someone has a broken arm, you can see that. It's right. there. There's a cast. This, we know how to treat it. We know how it heals. But with this disease, we can't see what's happening inside the brain, and we can't also see what's happening inside the – caregiver's experience or the care partner's experience. Um, so many family members will say that um, family and friends will check in with, oh, how's, you know, how's John doing? He's the one with the diagnosis. Um, and he maybe he's doing really well, but they don't feel like they have permission to say, and I'm really struggling. They feel like they need Ooh, to kind of stuff that down yes. and keep moving forward. Right. Um, Is that part of your caregiver identity theory? You well, mentioned something um, about a caregiver identity yeah, theory. Yeah, the caregiver identity theory um, is it's not it's not mine, and I'm blanking on um, who wrote it, uh, who wrote this article many years ago. But it really it describes this experience of a familial relationship, whether that's a mother and a daughter or a spouse. Um, so a familial relationship giving way to a caregiving relationship. So the point at which a, a wife no longer feels like a wife, she feels like a caregiver. So if you imagine a pie, um, maybe in the beginning a person only feels like a quarter caregiver, rest of the pie, they still feel like a spouse. Um, but as time goes on, that shifts and it does give way to a caregiving relationship. And when that happens... Research shows that caregivers are more likely to burn out and that a person is more likely is, – is at a higher risk of being placed in a nursing home because the caregiver burned out. Well, not only that, but we we sort of know it in the back of our minds is what we fear. But every change in that person means we're taking on yeah. a whole lot more responsibility. Yeah. 
right? Yeah. And that um, that in itself is overwhelming. Um, you can be fearful of it just in the future. Um, you know, that's hard. Yeah. That's just plain hard. There's nothing easy about caregiving. So I think the biggest key I see often is just keeping compassion and love for that person at the forefront of everything you do Mm -hmm. and recognizing that you set the emotional tone when you come into a room with that person. If you seem stressed or anxious or tearful, they're going to feed off of those emotions. Yeah. One of the things, be it fair or not, when I'm working with families, I tell them, you need to understand not everything can be blamed on the disease. And your actions create a reaction, Mm -hmm. especially with Alzheimer's. Now, with Lewy body, they may not need a trigger to have a behavior. Mm -hmm. But with Alzheimer's, I feel like a lot of times people really just feed off of others' emotions. Do you agree with that or not? I yeah I think I've seen that um, and that's part of the work that it's always helpful that the work that I do when I have families come in together and I can see that communication dynamic and see what the tone is and how they're speaking to each other mm-hmm. um, to make suggestions on that type of communication. Um, right. I, so I do think you know we know that the person with the disease can't make changes and so it it does fall on the family members to modify how they communicate. And I just want to recognize how hard that is sometimes for family members who are so sad and so angry and maybe even resentful that they have to do this. Um, Maybe maybe it wasn't a loving marriage in the first place, and so it's really hard to – to do that. And um, I do hope in those experiences, pe- family members are getting additional support, whether that's, um, you know, through a group or online or seeing someone individually. Um, yeah. You know, I have to tell you, I was on a, 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 a assessment just the other day. <laughs> and I, this happens in over and over again, anywhere you are, listeners out there, you're going to be shaking your heads. I can see you now. Um, I was with a woman who had been given a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. She actually seemed pretty sharp to me. And her husband was being a little overbearing and not letting her do anything Mm -hmm. anymore. And it was funny in the conversation I said to them, when was the last time you gave each other a kiss because you wanted to? They've been married 61 years, right? And they, they started to answer that they give each other a kiss every morning and every night. <laughs> and the daughter was there, and I actually just said, this sounds like depression to me. Mm-hmm. Like the the one of the people had lost their sense of purpose. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, and that basically she'd kind of fallen out of love with her husband, mm-hmm. you know, and that neither one of them understood what the word fun meant anymore. Yeah. They'd actually lived so long to a point where they weren't having fun anymore. So, you know, I was recommending senior centers and things like that because (laughs) it just was a reminder to me of how we miss the little things, you know, when we're when we're trying to look at the whole great big picture and the big mountain of all that stress we have for caregiving, we we sort of forget, you know. Yeah. When was the last time you kissed somebody because you liked yeah. them, you know, your husband or wife? And and those little nuances can't be lost in the course of the disease, yeah. especially with FTD, with behavior where memory loss isn't isn't there anymore. Yeah. You know, uh, or isn't, a, isn't, isn't an issue. It's still there. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. What are some other things that we should be talking about in this conversation today? Um, well, I... Keeping keeping the house safe, agno- you know, the various, yeah. like, agnosia and, and different definitions for people that they don't know, um, ideas for for self-care. Oh, there's, uh, there's so many. How much more time do we have? We have a lot. Uh, <laughs> we have over five minutes. Let's keep going. <laughs> well, um, you know, I, I'll say it again because it is really important. I'm sure everyone's heard this from their um, providers or other family members, but to get those affairs in order sooner rather than later is really yeah. important. The powers of attorney, if you're going um, to, if you need to talk about guardianship with an, an attorney, um, you know, start that conversation 
sooner rather than later. Um, get those things in order while the person can still be a part of that if they can. Um, Couldn't agree more. And let's let's break that down a little bit. Yeah. So why is the power of attorney important? Um, well, when the time comes that a person can no longer make decisions for themselves or speak for themselves, they need to appoint an agent who mm -hmm. can do that on their behalf. So they appoint someone to do that um, in medical settings. So that's the medical power of attorney. And then there's... Um, the ability to appoint someone to do that in financial settings. Um, sometimes that's the same person. Sometimes it's different. Right. And um, it doesn't always have to be a family member. No. It's just somebody that you yeah. trust yeah. with your care. Yeah. Right? And, you know, even though we don't ever want to overstep our bounds, sometimes there are, are places where um, you could – in interject yourself, especially if someone is trying to make a huge purchase and you need to help stop that purchase. Mm -hmm. And you may have to already have that in place, even if they're in the earliest stages, to yeah. try and stop that locomotion from being purchased. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, there so. are cases where a person would not be deemed incompetent, but they're making a lot of bad decisions. Right. Yeah, that are affecting yeah. their financial future. And right. And so it's just a good idea, right, yeah. to get uh, as you were saying, your affairs, but get maybe a will or your mm -hmm. estate or if you want to leave money yeah. uh, in a trust. or I mean, you, you, people have to do what they have to do. I mean, yeah. talk and to your attorney. You but. know, this, these diseases are also so devastating in that um, – the care we have, it's there's there's private pay care or there are services covered um, by Medicaid. Uh, Medicare doesn't Medicare covers a few things, but it doesn't cover long term care. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's more short term. So families really have to be thinking about planning for that, and right. meeting with an attorney can really help them understand if they do need need to apply for Medicaid at some point. You know, this is what they need to do in advance of that. They need to plan for that. Right. Um, and I'm going to throw something in there, yeah. too. If you go to an attorney, understand they're probably going to charge you $300 plus dollars an hour. There are uh, – you can watch your local TV stations and even look, um, you know, in your newspapers if people still read newspapers and especially in small places. Um, look and see if there's any financial aid offices that mm -hmm. maybe could assist you if, you, yeah. if that's a problem for you. But make sure you have uh, – for the person with the diagnosis, make sure you have your wants and your needs already listed on yeah. a piece of paper yeah. so you're not trying to recall them and for the family members don't go into this emotional and you sit there and have a conversation with your attorney like yeah. uh, you're having a conversation like we're having right now yeah. Mary because that's <laughs> going to cost you money know. so be uh, be ready yeah. right put, in, put your in things a lot together of, in a lot of um, states the Alzheimer's Association has offices and they offer free legal and financial planning seminars um, so I would suggest going to one of those first, write down your questions, and then some attorneys will even do, you know, a half hour free consult just to see if it's a good fit with their practice. So, okay. um, you know, I wanted to, before we end today, I did want to um, just remind people um, that they that they aren't alone in this experience. Yeah. There really are supports right. that can help, and it's a matter of connect and really um, plugging into what those things are. And I know it's different geographically, but finding someone who can who can be that lighthouse for you and be that person that can direct you where you need to go um, right. when as things change because things change over time. Um, and. Um, I think for family members also and for people with a diagnosis, um, really being aware of what helps keep them calm and what grounds them and he keeps them connected to who we are or to who they are, um, they're really going to need to rely on those things more. And so making time for that but also finding new ways of doing that because um, mm -hmm. the things we used in the past to cope might not work now. This is really different. So being open to trying new things, whether that's meditation or – a different form of exercise or talk therapy. Yoga, um, anything, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Well, before we go, I also want to tell my listeners that um, just over the last month, I have now put new information on my website. And what I did was I made it a knowledge center instead of my bundles. 
And so what I did was I uh, went ahead and just took information that was already on my website and I uh, reworked it so now you can download this information and it's all kinds of information, everything you'd ever want to know. And I put information about frontal temporal. I put information about Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's and Lewy body, how to talk to your doctor, how to talk to your family, how to get through holidays, things like that. Mary, I would love for you to write something sure, for my for my site and yeah. under my new knowledge center. Yeah. And it's free to everyone, how to apply for Medicaid, when do you get Medicare? How to bathe without a battle? Tons of information. Yeah. There's actually 45 pieces of information on my website. So, Mary, thank you for being here today. Thank you so much, Jill. This was such an honor. And I'd love to have you back. Anytime. And let's, uh, <laughs> let's continue to give resources and educate our folks out there yeah. because they need us. And I'm super excited to tell all of you and thank you for listening. I have listeners in 49 states and 38 countries right now. The only one I'm lacking in the United States is Montana. So come on, tell someone you know in Montana to listen to the show. <laughs> we have lots of great information for you. All righty. I hope everybody has a terrific a day, the rest of your week. And remember, I'm always here for you. And I'll see you next week on Dementia Resilience with Jill Lorenz. Living and working with Alzheimer's and other dementias can often be challenging. Summit Resilience Training provides education, utilizing non-medical approaches for those who work with our friends affected by dementia. Believing families still need one-on-one -on -one assistance, we provide classes which help them understand the diseases affecting their loved ones, offering strategies and techniques for success with activities of daily living and working with confusing behaviors. We offer in-home assessments to clarify symptoms of dementia diseases and help families work together to find moments of joy while living with memory loss and impairment. Education programs instilling person-centered care philosophies are offered for professional caregivers working in communities and homes, which can be customized for their staff. Training is also available for first responders, such as law enforcement, fire, and EMT personnel. We are passionate that people with dementias, such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and others, are approached with compassion and understanding, and those who work with them have all the tools they need for success. Call us at Summit Resilience Training, 303-420-6988 to schedule a class or in-home assessment. Visit our website at summitresiliencetraining.com for more information. You've been listening to Dementia Resilience with Jill Lorenz. To learn more about her resources, services, classes, or to book speaking engagements, visit Jill's website at summitresiliencetraining.com. A new podcast drops every Tuesday, so join us as we learn more about dementias, resilience, and overcoming obstacles to find a positive outcome. Dementia Resilience with Jill Lorenz can be found on your favorite podcast provider. Please subscribe and give us a five-star rating. Musical and technical support provided by Brian Hunter. See you next week.